Yeah, that stuff to Facebook and stuff, that's what the email. Everybody, thanks for coming along. Probably everybody knows me. If you don't, I'm Paula Larkin and I'm the project activist for Spirit of the Whole. So today we've got the first of our show and tell. We hope to make this a kind of regular uh, event every quarter uh, and, you know, supported by the Mitchell Library. I'm not sure if you know much about the Spirit of Revolt Archive, but it was set up in 2011 uh, by a small group of people to collect and uh, preserve and give access to uh, the archives of uh, people from Glasgow, groups from Glasgow that were involved in uh, campaigns, activism, work class history, uh, and to make that available to the general public through the National Library Research Room. So, I don't know, Keith, would you want to say anything more? I'm going to just go through. No, not at this stage, maybe jump yeah. in when, when the thoughts are more sorted out. <laughs> All right, so um, since that happened, what the, the group meet and They've got an acquisitions policy which says what kind of material that they're going to collect. And that was put together in conjunction with uh, Glasgow City Archives. And the main idea is for uh, things to be digitised so that people can have access to it wherever they are. So they have the website and volunteers come in and scan the material. And then it's uploaded onto the website and eventually all the material will go up to Glasgow City Archives and if you want to come and actually see the hard copy which we've got out on the tables today, you can access it there. The first collection uh, that was donated was the Alan Burnett collection uh, and that's all digitised and you can access that here. Um, and there's now 36 collections. Online there's 33 and I've been working on another three. So the, the collection's always growing. Um, and some of the stuff that we're bringing in at the moment is from Fazlane. Um, and a lot are from individuals who've de donated the material. So today we're starting with John Cooper collection. This is John Cooper here. And he's chosen four specific uh, parts of his collection. The first is the Casamilk Claimants Union. The second is uh, material from the anti-poll tax campaign. The third is material from the miners' strike. And the fourth is material from uh, a campaign to save Netherton Primary School. We've also got uh, some material from uh, John's collection on housing over here and there's material here which is uh, newspaper clippings from uh, the poll tax. So the idea is that people come in and have a look around and um, John can answer any questions or we can start just a bit of a dialogue, maybe start with the claimant union stuff. How would people like to do it? Do you want to, I think everybody said a look at the well, people who quiz me. What you were saying, like that I'm always attracted to newsletters and newspapers. So these claimant newspapers, but you were saying that this was from England, this stuff? As far as I can remember now, the other people are here that know about this as well, because over a period of time, your memory goes a bit. And also, the fact that other people here means I can't embellish it as much as I would, <laughs> would like, you know. Hey. So, Keith might be able to tell us. I'm assuming they were English papers, is that right, Keith? Yeah, Just no, I, I think it'd be good to hear a wee background of how, how you came to be involved in the Castlemont one and how I could uh, remember, recall some of the 
some of the uh, mushrooming of uh, claiming Sweden's Scotland and mm-hmm. then how we came to <coughs> be in contact with the National Federation of Claimants Union and we right. adopted the Claimants Charter which obviously was a more radical if very brief statement on where we were um, and then we made a, a famous trip to, uh, to England to a conference which we'll save that one for last because <laughs> that has got a sort of a, yeah, sort of uh, dark side of it. Aye. <laughs> I'm glad Keith's here because I'm going to give you the fun stuff <laughs> and the light-hearted stuff. And, uh, but it was serious as well, obviously. But I can only give you from, from my perspective. And the fact that Keith lived in a different uh, bit of Glasgow and it was a, a different setup there, he'll be able to tell you a bit about that and correct some of my misunderstandings or whatever. Uh, Carol and I have lived in Castlemilk most of our life. We don't live there now, but that's where we lived most of our life. For anybody at Disney know, Castlemilk's a housing scheme in the south side of Glasgow. Uh, at one point it was reckoned to be the largest housing scheme in Europe, mm. 40,000 people. And one of the things that we were involved in there it hardly any amenities initially uh, so a lot of young families at that time Carol and I were in our 20s and with uh, John at the time and uh, as I say there was an awful lot of amenities so an awful lot of the young families there got together and tried to organise things like playgroups and deal with housing issues and so on so it was quite good in a way that that happened, you know, that there was that whole groundswell of young uh, people and we became active, uh, not through choice, but through necessity in a way, you know, to get the things that we needed. And one of these things when some of us uh, fell in hard times, were unemployed and so on, one of the things that we looked into, I, I, I don't quite know how we found out about it in Castlemilk was the idea of a claimant union. Now we, I think we, we knew they already existed. Uh, my belief is it, it's originated, started in England, the claimant union movement, and we heard about it up in Castlemilk, and we thought that would be a really good idea. The whole thing about the claimant union, of course, is just like people that are in work are represented by a union. The unemployed, the disabled, the sick, the one they in work are able to work. They didn't have any that that type of a protection or anybody to fight their corner for them. So that was the whole point here. Yeah. And interestingly enough, at the time, the attitude of the trade unions was they didn't want a a non-working members. Now trade unions are open to and I've got community membership and stuff like that. I'm a member of the Unite Community Union in Glasgow. But at that time there was there any kind of protection if you were unemployed, sick or disabled and you were you largely felt you were on your own. You had to deal with things. So three or four years up in Castlemilk had got together. We were already involved in other things that were going on. And we thought that would be a good idea, the Claimants Union idea. So, and this is where my memory gets a bit hazy. I'm not really good at the very the kind of facts and so on. But if I could maybe just uh, say that for that wee group in Castlemilk, now there may have been other people, I don't know how early Keith was involved in his neck of the woods. And I know that some people in Govan Hill say that they were already on the go. <coughs> it was my belief that we were the first in, in Casimir. Well, that might be wrong. No, it's not even important. You, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? The Albert Ionella. That's Bert, right. From Dumb Chapel. That's right. Actually, uh, and then Bert, in fact, Bert came yeah, out and so helped us. He was a trailblazer, right. essentially, but he hadn't really created, helped create a network organisations. Uh-huh. kind of 
person orientated, I think. So I think, you know, he was technically around first, but somehow yeah, he just caught the moment and we all sort of started doing things around at the Aye. same time. Could you tell us what, about what year this was? Sorry. What year? What years are we talking about? Seventy six, seventy seven, seventy eight. Remember that? See, I couldn't even answer <laughs> that exactly. You know, it might be down there in black yeah, and white yeah, somewhere. Yeah, you know. Uh, but I, uh, he's quite right. He, uh, Albert Bert Ianello, he who was a lovely guy, he very funny guy. He helped us out in Castle Milk with various leaflets he had composed and so on, and. He told us just basically rip them off, just put cast of milk on them or whatever. And that's how we started out. And I remember we used to get people coming from other areas and looking for a bit of help. And we said, well, do our best, we can't help you. But ideally, you should get half a dozen people for your area and invite us down and we'll give you some kind of talk about how to organise in this respect. And that's what happened, and ultimately I think there was something with 13 climate unions in and around Glasgow. Mm -hmm. uh, the whole point of the climate union, well, to be in the climate union you had to be a claimant, right? That isn't to say that uh, others, other people weren't really welcome at the meetings. They were, at least how we operated, was if uh, the meetings ever had to go to a vote, which was not necessarily the best way to achieve a consent, we preferred consensus if everybody could agree, but it meant that people that weren't claimants couldn't significantly influence things, you know. We were always happy to hear other people and so on, but that's that was essentially it. So ultimately it developed into a wee bit of a movement, certainly in in and around Glasgow and Keith will be able to tell you more about the relationship we had with the English mm -hmm. people. We did have a couple of conferences. I think they came up to Glasgow on one occasion people from England and we certainly went down there to a conference in London but as Keith said, we'll, we'll leave that to the last. Mm -hmm. uh, so what's the so the unemployed workers centres, um, what, what was their relationship to the Climate Union? Well, they, uh, as far as I can remember, they came afterwards. Right, 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 right. And <coughs> some of us that had been in the Climate Union were involved, for example, in the Unemployed Workers Centre in Casamilk. Right. Until one day we went to a meeting in the city a centre with the TUC or whoever, and we found out that there was two unemployed workers groups in Castle Milk. And it was a guy who had been in our group, had private talks with a, a Stalinist in the TUC or whatever, and they decided that they wanted rid of us. So they adopted his group at that meeting. His group was him. And they, <laughs> and they, they actually ultimately had to get the cops to remove us from whatever it was, some TUC building that we were in. And we went up. At this point, the other, this is after the climate changed quite a bit. And it was basically a big hut, right, that they put up in Castle Milk. And we went up and broke the door and changed the lock and everything, you know. And they, but that only gave them a bit of bother. And then they elected a uh, chair, a uh, manager for the centre, who was also a local councillor, or who became a, a councillor, a real good yes man for the the Labour Party, and uh, and we said, what are we thinking of here? We're fighting our a garden shed, you know. Let's just leave it, and we did, and he just turned it into a a pool hall, and the the manager get a write up in the papers as being incompetent and never in the place and uh, being asleep in bed when the reporter came in the door at, in the afternoon <laughs> and stuff like that and he uh, and uh, that was the end of that the Labour Party had to remove him from the unemployed workers centre interestingly at the same time as or just after the climate union had started 
you got other bodies coming in like the Citizens Advice Bureau mm -hmm. and that's ultimately when we had to close down because we had struggled to get a bit of funding and then when three years later, four years later when the Citizens Advice came along they withdrew our funding but this time we were becoming a real headache anyway and that was a good excuse to withdraw the funding because they would be duplicating a service that was how it was put and uh, but that was only one of the things that the whole group of people in Castle Milk were involved in at the time you know so it's my experience an awful lot of things that we, we are involved in we've, we've got to be involved in I'll be kind of ad hoc things you know they don't need to necessarily just be a one thing that's going to last for 30 years hey uh, so that that was uh, that basically did yeah, I ask, sorry, was it? Did you say the first claimants union started in Drumchapel? Well, to my knowledge, in Glasgow, uh, yeah. that would have been maybe in the mid seventies or before. Yeah, would you say because Drumchapel had a lot of people decanted in from the Altenments, mm. and Castlebilt was the same? That's right. Was that a kind of new kind of people coming into environments and wanting a clean start? sick of the old system and, and having a bit of fire about them, would you would you say there were other places that decanted into that had the same kind of ideas the young people getting together or was it just a coincidence that Drumchapel and Castle Milk mm. uh, started these things because they were decanted into from the old tenements, from the old uh, style of uh, I don't know how, what, what happened in Drumchapel, I, I, but I would sort of say that Albert Iron Eller, who was the main sort of uh, character, he had connections politically going right back to Guy Aldred and the, uh, you know, the, the remnants of the, the word and the uh, United Socialist movement and stuff. So, you know, he wasn't just a, you know, a, a claimants activist, you know, there was a whole political theory behind what he was doing. You know. And that was for us as well. We came from a slightly different approach. I certainly, by the late seventies, we were embracing theories from Italy about take over the city and stuff. And you were involved in fair fairs, and so you were, the the activity was wasn't wasn't an isolated activity, a uh, single issue activity, it was part of a, a, gen a more general critique of society. Yeah. Was he uh, I was coming to the West End, so the West End was yeah. completely different, it was people who were only unemployed temporarily, bed sitter land, you know, uh, rented accommodation, or I'd been actually previously a squatter as well, so a uh, totally different situation from a more a settled community like there was in Castlemilk. Uh, but he was active before Drumchapel as well? Yeah, he, he would be involved right from the mid to late 50s he, he, in the sort of generation of people like Marker McClay and Ben Mullen and I uh, understand that that's the kind of people that were around who would have known Guy Aldred in his later years and um, Ethel MacDonald, the SA2 before she departed. But I think you're right, what Keith was described when I first came into anarchism, <coughs> he, Keith and a, a number of other people were already involved and there was a kind of, it just exactly what Keith described, maybe even squatting a bit and he, students or whatever and <coughs> our situation was a bit different in that we were raising a family, we were in a housing scheme, most of the people we knew were in that situation, you know, mm -hmm. and as I say, the things that we were involved in came about really by necessity, mm -hmm. uh, but still I suppose the same roots were there, you know, uh, I'd found it about anarchism, I'd made up my mind I was an anarchist, and I was beginning to he become aware of people like Guy Aldred and various other people. He, but you know, I think the development is parallel, but no, you know, in different ways. But it just occurred to me, I haven't really told you what we did in the Climate Union. <laughs> the whole point of it was that 
we were very, we decided very early on it would be very much direct action. And in the 80s, and I'm really angry that this, in the situation that exists at the moment with job centres, I don't understand why nobody is challenging that whole thing. And when I say nobody, I don't mean an individual. I mean a group of people that are getting together and organising and try to challenge the situation there. For example, when you go to a job centre, you don't get in the door unless you've got an appointment to see somebody specifically. And they've got security guards. Now, at the, in the days of the Claimants Union, we were a... We didn't have so much stake in the problems. There was security guards, but they tended to be old guys that were retired or whatever, you know, just uh, moving from bit to bit in the office spaces. So we used to get in bundles of leaflets and we used to hand them out to everybody that was sitting in the office. The security guard would come on, well, what's going on here, you know, you can't do that, you know, and by and large we just ignored them just gave out the leaflets and the leaflets were saying to people who hey, don't face them without representation. You can call in any of us here at the moment to accompany you to your interview. You've got the right for that. And believe it or not, people are still having to argue that at various offices, job centres, which is a right. It's there and it's actually in black and white and people are still having to argue this on a regular basis at job centres. Some of our comrades in Ed Edinburgh are very, very active in that whole thing and they're having, they face this quite a lot. So, <coughs> in the days it was quite new though. So we gave everybody leaflets, we told them you don't need to go up there. We also became aware that you've got to have the right vocabulary and you could go up, for example, and say to somebody at the desk, I don't have any money, I'm skint, I need help or whatever, and that did they wash with them. But if you went up and said, I'm destitute, believe it or not, they had a, a Bible that they used, it was a, a code of practice, and if you used that a particular word, they couldn't ignore you, they had to deal with you, they had to do something about it. Well, that, they might have sent you to Minerva Street, mind you. Sorry? They might have sent you to Minerva <laughs> Street. Aye, <laughs> right. <laughs> Which is just down at you know, Finistown, yeah? Uh -huh. was. But anyway. That thing was called the A-Codes, if I remember yeah. right. And it was a kind of one of these uh, loose-leaf volume things that get updates every so often. And one of the characters that was involved in our group was a Trotskyist boy, and he said... Uh, what we need to do is build a, an alliance with the unions and so on. And we said, we're fighting the unions most of the time in the office. And, but he was so insistent, we said, well, uh, superficially it does make some kind of sense, so why don't we do that? So obviously by this time we had read and we understood how the, the DHSS, as it was in the days, operated. And they had people we called snoopers. I can't even remember their proper title now. But they used to go in people's houses unexpectedly. And it was really to see if people were cohabitating. That was one of their big things. And they would take the most, uh, com commit the most flagrant abuses. They would just, when the person opened the door, they would just enter the house. Uh, no waiting to be invited or whatever. People didn't know their rights, and they would get into people's bedrooms and uh, toilets and look for signs that there might have been, it was generally women that they did this way, and look for signs that there might be a man, you know, a razor or something like that, and they uh, asked people embarrassing questions, you know. So that was one of our prime targets, our prime hates in the Climate Union. So when we got the people up for the Union, uh, and they were all very cagey, of course. Uh, we're not here representing the the THSS, blah, 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 you know. And in the 80s, it was uh, the fashion, what was it, dungarees and stuff like that were very much in. 
and big badges, people like big badges. And a lot of these people had anti-Nazi badges on, right, the, the Union people. And their first question to them is, why are you all wearing anti-Nazi badges when you are behaving like fascists, you know? So that was a nice opener, you know. <laughs> and he, but eventually we had a chat with him, and he, we said, this is really unacceptable, and it still happens today. Some of the people that are dishing out some of the worst uh, things in job centres are trade union members. Mm-hmm. And I've, I've been on about this for the last four or five years in Unite, and then for anywhere else I'll, I'll, I can make the point. And that's not on. I mean, that should be just absolutely scandalous. The whole issue of sanctioning, for example, could have been stopped in its tracks. The union should never have agreed to implement that. And I know all the arguments, the ins and outs, that I've heard it all. I've argued with the people in the, the trade union hierarchy about it all. But anyhow, we told them after we had reached some kind of understanding that one of the things that we needed was the A-codes, or a copy of the A-codes. And here, lo and behold, one time when we appeared at the wee place that we operated from, there was a carrier bag with a couple of the, the folders, mm. and it was copies of the A-codes, mm. which were really good for us because it meant when we went down to represent somebody, we could just look up all the <laughs> stuff that was needed and use the right terminology that they couldn't uh, wriggle out of. Another thing that we did was that we had went to the social work department and we'd asked them for a room there. Also we asked them for a grant because at that point social work departments could give out grants. Section 12 I think they were called, I'm not sure. And we got some ridiculously small amount of money, you know, a hundred pound or hundred and fifty pound or something. And the uh, we also said we, need, we, we could do with the use of a room, so they gave us a room and we said, and telephone, you know, so they put in a phone in the room. And one of the things we used to do on a daily basis was that we would phone the head office, the DHSS in Edinburgh, because one of the things there was if you didn't receive satisfaction at a local office, you could phone the head office and they they had to take it up. It's like going to the cops and making a, a an issue or something. They've got to they can't just ignore it. They've got to <coughs> take a note of it. Uh, so we did this on a daily basis, and we got people. People had been turned away from their local office, refused money, refused help. The the old story about the gyro no arriving in the post and things like that, and the uh, Edinburgh. Must have had to contact that office, straighten it out with him, and then the person was able to get back to and get their money. And then eventually, we also had a liaison guy in the social work department who he kept us up to date with what they, they were thinking and stuff and what they were happy with or whatever. And one day he came to us and said, uh, the chief guy in the social work department was they very happy because Edinburgh had phoned him, the DHS and Edinburgh had phoned them and complained about the amount of hassle we were causing them <laughs> by phoning every, every day, you know. And we had a two minute discussion about it. He had asked us not to do it, you know, through his boss, had asked us not to do it. So we had a couple of minutes discussion about it. And we says to Bob, the the liaison guy, well, ask your boss if he'd prefer him getting the hassle <laughs> or Edinburgh, eh, because that's what's going to happen if you, if you don't just behave yourself, you know. And he went away and he came back and he says, carry on. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So, but, but the, the climate union, in my opinion, was very, very successful. I mean, it's got to be, isn't it, if people organise and really pursue the thing in that way. So we, we get people uh, thousands of pounds in grants and stuff like that, which they were entitled to, let's not forget that. 
one of the big points that we made all the time was that every year when they done their calculations, there was £700 million pounds of unclaimed benefit. Now, it wasn't the unclaimed benefit, it was benefit they managed to not to give to people, you know. So that, that that's the sort of thing we did at that point in the Climate Union. So anybody want to ask any questions about organisation or...? I've got another one because I work for the Citizens Advice Bureau and uh, I was very interested when you said that you'd started, you were a pre precursor really to that kind of environment, except you were more political. When the Citizens Advice Bureau came along, yeah, were funded by the government as well, partially. Therefore, more recently, there was this um, legislation about charities. If, if charities receive money from the government, they were not allowed to actively go out and work against the government. But you seem to be like a, a Trotskyist kind of influence and anarchist influence. CAB became very strong, but would you say you were somehow ousted by the CAB and their connections with the government because of your political beliefs, not necessarily what you were actually doing for the people? Would, would, you, would you say that was a fair comment or not? I would say it was both of the things, you know, it was... I they, they used the Citizens Advice Bureau when it arrived, not to give us funding, and that meant the thing died, obviously. And they, they wanted us out of the way, and obviously they didn't like the political angle. But that that's the whole thing about... When you go to a Citizens Advice Bureau, you expect a certain thing, you know? Uh -huh. And when you go to any other kind of authority-based type thing, you know, if you if I go to see a lawyer, for example, I know to what extent he's prepared to to help or whatever. But we weren't, we didn't have any of these restrictions. I mean, bear in mind, it wasn't just a battle about with the, the social security. Mm. It's a battle against the system, the whole system that we don't like, the capitalist system. So that was only one aspect to that. So the cab so kind of ousted you. Sorry? The cab kind of ousted you, weakened you, the citizens' advice. It mm. took away a certain energy and a certain... Well, there was a tension anyway within the claimants' unions as they developed. You know, some claimants' unions had, had a political consciousness. They were wanting to uphold the claimants' charter, wanting to link up with claimants' union, unions around England, etc. Others were just really into to being too good as and to, uh, you know, uh, wanting to, uh, you know, help people's rights and whatever. And that obviously fed directly into, uh, there was a greater amount of mass unemployment post-79 with Thatcher, etc. Uh, into the early 80s, uh, there was a mass mushrooming of the poverty industry, as I call it, you know. All sorts of organisations were created and people who were had to get jobs such as myself ended up in that you know environment. I didn't work for CEB, but I worked for an independent uh, the organisation in North Pollock, and you're overwhelmed by demand because a lot of people who had previously been in employment were it was a big shakeout of industries, and you know suddenly it was a you know it was much there was a, it was a different scenario from the mid to late seventies when uh, you know it was a Labour government. There wasn't as much <coughs> employment. Uh, there was. Uh, different uh, situation going on. It was a completely, it was a slightly more neoliberal agenda from then onwards. So, uh, you know, the claimants union did kind of wither away a bit. There was there was a replacement, I suppose, for a while in the unemployed workers set uh, organisations. But uh, and then John will go on to talk about some other activities that you know, people's. Uh, as I say, there was a tension within the Claims Union Federation in Glasgow. There was some unions I seem to recall, like Rutherglen and whatever. They were just, you know, didn't really seem to have any political perspective at all, you know. And others were, you know, were much more political. So that would be, you know, that would be a, a dynamic we had to cope with. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, 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 the did, did you have kind of fundraisers and things like that as well to bring in funds? Or 
I can't quite remember, you know that. To some I'm, extent, although we did all, you know, get the hundred pounds from each respective social work organisation, had to set up a, a bank account and all the rest of it, you know. Um, uh, but in the did they all have? Did was, they all have offices in all these different claimant unions in Glasgow? I didn't yeah, realise it was like you were saying. The, the likes of it. some of the other ones, like the West End, was a lot more nebulous. So there wasn't. <coughs> There's no, the link to the social work department is very, very, very weak. You know, there was, we got a grant from them, but basically we just we set up a, a surgery in a, a wee shop in Bank Street for some reason we had a, a link to, and we had a phone, and that phone was just used. We only really met weekly. We didn't have the kind of intensity I was John's describing in Castlebolt, you know, mm. maybe due to supply and demand and other people doing other things, but... Uh, we uh, we were on the phone to Lady Lawson Street though. <laughs> in mm. Edinburgh, you know, that was one of the tactics. Uh, the brew, you would go to the brew and uh, leaflet as well as the, uh, the Social Security office. You know, mm. And you would highlight things people could you know, claim. So you, know, you were, you know, likes of exceptional needs payments, additional requirements and things. There were add-on things you could get at that time within your... Your, your supplementary benefit, as it was called. You know. um, <laughs> if people had moved into a new house, yeah. you know, they didn't have a thing. Yeah. Now you've, you've got no chance of getting anything, mm. or people are actually getting loans. I mean, in the 1970s, we thought things were bad, mm -hmm. but we never imagined that they would actually people would have to get a loan to furnish their, their house and all that. Mm. I also forgot to say that when people came to the meetings, we obviously were not leafleting, we, we advertised the claimant union everywhere we could. And when people came, usually people from Castlemilk, as I said, came to the meetings, they would come by usually a specific thing, not just necessarily a social security problem. Or we found out, we became aware that when people came to be one thing, they often did half a dozen things, you know. So we made a point of asking them that their electricity was disconnected or they couldn't pay a gas bill that was coming up, whatever. And a lot of people fiddled, fiddled their electricity, mm -hmm. you know. That was quite common. And uh, we put out a, a cartoon type leaflet uh, telling people that this had kept their attention and uh, it was really a terrible thing, this. And because people were getting caught for fiddling their electricity because they were doing it in a really ham fisted way. <laughs> so the rest of the cartoon explained how to do it properly. <laughs> and, then, and then we denounced it again at the end, you know. <laughs> so, uh, but the, I, one of the things that we, we did when people came to a weekly meeting or whatever or came with a problem, uh, we said to them, the whole point in the claimant union is, is that we're going to take your problem off you and take it away and solve it. We're going to help you to solve it. Yeah. And that way you'll be able to help other people and deal with it again if it happens to you. And we encourage them to become involved in the organisation. Uh, and some did. We had at times like 30, 40 people, but that's the kind of peak, you know, yeah. at one time. And it had a lot of other knock-on things. I mean, for example, in the local housing department where people went to pay their rent, there was a wee section of chairs in rows, and that was for people that were in their ears. And these people would all sit in these chairs waiting to be seen one at a time. And they wouldn't speak to each other. I mean, everybody knew if you were sitting in that section why you were there. So it's that whole... Uh, social kind of isolation and mm. and that's the sort of things that we were trying to break down. Mm. We were saying to people, listen, if you can't pay your rent, uh, it's no surprising if you're either get a, a crap wage, a very low wage, or you're living in social security money. So don't feel as if it's your fault because everything was designed, obviously, to make people feel a small and insecure, you know, and it was their fault, you know. Mm. So that's one of the big things that we try to tackle in that. But the essential thing was 
helping people. Our experience is if you went to a social worker, for example, they would take your story and then say, hey, give me five minutes, they would disappear into another room, make phone calls and come back and tell you. Well, I'm glad to say it's been resolved, you know. Well, we didn't operate like that. We tried to show people. And it worked, obviously, and it worked in the sense that people came back. We also told them, listen, don't think because this has been resolved, that's going to be the end of your problems. As long as we have the crap system that we have, you're always going to have problems like that or others, you know. So that that's what the whole essence of the thing was. I wonder if you can clarify a memory of mine. <laughs> um, I was a teenage mum in the 80s and uh, I didn't know anything about benefits. I'd gone to university for a year, hated it, left, gone and done work with CMD and then pregnant and then baby born and I uh, lived in Spring Hall. But somebody, some welfare rights officer or whatever appeared out of nowhere and basically got me loads of money for all the baby things, for the the house. I needed it, it was bona fide, but um, I don't know where he came from. You know, I was a teenage mum, it was like foggy, foggy times, mm -hmm. trying to look back. Mm, I think his name was Chris something. Chris Thor. Ah, Chris Thor. that was his name. He was a legend. Yeah. He was a legend. <laughs> 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 he didn't do right away. Involved <laughs> what they were doing, explain. He just... It was like he was Robin Hood, and uh -huh. that was his position. Who was he? Uh, he's he's so he's used to do it. He's used to community <laughs> action. <laughs> <laughs> community <laughs> action paper, news magazine is in the archive, and I think Chris used to contribute some stuff to that. Mm -hmm. He was a bit of a Whose maverick individual. In? Community action, whose collection is that in? Uh, but it's been actually um, archived at the moment by Sarah, who's still doing scanning in the room as we right, talk. Right. <laughs> Whose collection is it in? Sorry, um, is it, it's not a. Sean Cooper's. Ah, right, yeah. right. I think it's also in mine and some other right. collections. It's right. in a spread of old famous places. But I tell you what, he made a really significant yeah. difference yeah. to me in that phase of my life, yeah. completely. And um, it went from being, oh my god, oh my god, you know, how am I going to cope with all this? How am I going oh, to. To feeling like, and you know, a wee angel had arrived, mm. and, and it, it made things manageable. And you know, Hi. my kitchen had like pots and pans in it and things mm -hmm. like that. You know, and that his touch on people's lives. I mean, I think he was acting outside his remit when he worked for me. Was uh -huh. he a, was he a Castle Milk Welfare Rice officer? No, it was uh, Mary Hill. Actually. Mary yeah. Hill. Well, well, I lived in some Castle Milk. I lived in Spring Hall, which mm. was completely opposite end of the city <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but um, I remember we went to Pitt Street or something I don't know where it was for an appeal somewhere I don't know but I mean I wouldn't even have known to, that appeals existed uh, uh -huh, you know what I, mean? I don't know how he came involved with mm. Aye. no recollection Aye. But, um, I think that's quite interesting what you're saying because that's something I forget you know when you assume that young people are going to either know it or you tell them at once and that's it, they understand it. But obviously that is the case, you know. Mm. I Especially if you're in, you know, if you're a teenage mum mm. and you've not got much support. That's right. All you're dealing with Aye. is nappies and feeding them. That's right. You know? Aye. That's it. Okay. Is he still in Glasgow? No idea. I mean, I, no, I, 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 I used to work in that field up to 2009, but uh, so I would come across Chris occasionally, um, but I, I have no idea where he is or where he, I suspect he'd be retired. You know? mm. uh, but uh, one he's, you just have to Google his name, <laughs> <laughs> and check out. Maybe he's on Facebook or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but he was part of that culture that you're talking about. Aye. You know, uh, he was on your side. He yeah, was a he good was one guy. Of the yeah, ones. yeah. Uh, he was very good. Yeah. Well, needless to say, we came across some welfare rights officers and a lot of them were very good, you know, quite kind of radical and they probably went 
beyond the rebit as well. well one was Hugh Henry, who went on to be a Scottish government minister uh, uh, after, he denounced, after he denounced being a militant. Uh. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I think there's something quite interesting there, and Keith had it right in the head, and it uh, ties on a bit with my personal recollection. Mm. He said, You just have to Google his name. Mm. I remember these events as they happened in the late 70s, mm. Mm. growing up in the housing scheme. If you lived in a housing scheme, you were in bloody isolation. Mm. They were five miles from the city centre. You were poor. Most of the people that you coexisted with in that housing scheme were poor. You went anywhere, you walked. You got out and about the same way people had done 500 years previously. I remember us walking practically everywhere. And I remember me and you walking to the brew one day. And I remember you got us a smoked sausage supper and you said, listen son, it won't always be this good. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, more importantly, <coughs> we've got to remember and it's easy forgot by the people that were old enough to be there and it's not known at all by the people that were too young. This is a time before mobile phones. Yeah. This is a yes. time before the internet. You really were in isolation. Working class people, by and large, didn't have cars. So even communicating or connect, connecting with somebody in Springburn was bloody difficult. A lot of the people you knew didn't even have a landline. And if they did have a landline and they were working class, half the time it was disconnected. <laughs> so you really was connection with other people, particularly radical left people, or even just mildly socialist people, was really quite, quite difficult. I spent a significant part of my childhood being sent as a runner to tell people about various meetings going to go and tell Mrs. Such and Such that we're meeting at half seven the morning night. And one of my abiding memories of my childhood in the Claimants Union was finishing, in the good old days you finish school at five to four every day. And I remember walking the 20 minute walk home, knackered, glad to be home, chat my own front door, my man down the inn. Oh no, they're at the social work department, they're at the claimants union, trips all the way back up the road to the claimants union, and sure enough my mum and dad were there, because they were still dealing with somebody's case, by which time of course the social work department had also closed, but they'd kept the people at the social work department in the late, and where does it all tie into the, the anarchism and stuff? One of the things I remember very, very, very clearly, a tiny, tiny room, if you had ten people in it, you were like that. I remember going in that room in the social work department, closing the door, and on the back of the door, my father had cut out various bits of coloured paper and sat with felt markers, writing out various anarchist quotes and sticking them up. And I remember being 12 years old and going, all property is theft, put on. <laughs> so there was, there was definitely an anarchist philosophy running through it, at least your involvement in the whole thing. But I think that's really important to stress. It's always been hard for working class people. Working class people have always suffered. But ironically, we are actually more technology rich now. We've got communication, which we didn't have at that time. The thing that always brought me about Casimir, well, generally in these times, this is a kind of imagination. I mean, we get website with a radical imagination. But there was no phones, there was no technology. The imagination just now seems to be dead sophisticated. But does it translate you know, to govern? Does it translate to outside the brew when you're leafleting and stuff like that? And, you, you know, that lack of technology to me had something to do with that. You know, if you're poor, you had to be imaginative. Mm. You know, the, the ideas with it the caravans outside the housing office and stuff like that. You know, that, that was entertainment as well, but it was obviously important entertainment in lots of ways. I don't think there's enough of that goes on just now. You, you know, where you can invent ideas just to get yourself in a situation with it, slowing in your leaflets and everybody's dodging at your road and stuff like that. You know what I mean? There's a good example of imagination yes, back into the street. You know, lots of folk are going vegan these days. Mm. Um, well, there's a wee kind of vegan anarchist thing that they they make food and they take it and they put it on a table on Sucky Hall Street and give it to people. Mm. And mm. Um, so I think it's just called Big Vegan Cookout. And it was it was like a group of young folk that just want to spread the word. 
So mm. they, I'm sure they've not got a food licence or anything mm. like that. <laughs> They're just making their own food and taking it, and we each one had our own wee tray, because I went yeah. in to check it out yesterday, and it was so inspiring, because they were out on the street and they were just giving folk food, mm. you know, and Aye. folk were enjoying the food. And that, so that's yeah. kind of along it's those lines. It's not difficult yeah. for individuals. Just to do something uh -huh. that people notice. Uh -huh. And people forget this. We got so direct action, you know. Yeah. Well, another thing that was quite common was agit prop. You know, you'd get a mm -hmm. group of four or five people just on the street corner, just making, telling very simple stories. And people would come and watch. But, I mean, I haven't seen that for years and years and years. But mm -hmm. I don't know why we're not doing it now. Yeah. Was, that one of the things I want to bring up was, it wasn't just by accident that, the 40,000 of you were out in Castle Milk. It was a deliberate plan. Because a lot many say. people had been previously in Gorbals, which actually had a community and which was a center of radicalism, they quite deliberately shifted uh, all those destroyed Gorbals and shifted them out to the hinterlands. Um, so it was, and I think, yeah, that's to keep in mind, this isn't by accident uh, that people, want, working class people, wound up in these schemes on the outer uh, limits. Well, one, one point I want to raise though about the claimants union, well, a couple points. One is the the funding part. I, I get nervous when uh, radical groups depend on government money, and, and to say, well, they withdrew it and it then w then withered, then makes me even more mm -hmm. <laughs> that that shouldn't have happened. That's something to think about in terms of future uh, organizations to depend on the government for your funding. That's asking for trouble. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can, and to then complain that they withdrew it. I mean, come on now, really. What, uh, what yeah. did you expect? They were gonna, yeah. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Um, so that's one thing. Um, and I understand that's not a, a uh, that's a repeating phenomenon within Glasgow. The uh, Labour Party, in particular, was very good at you know bringing groups on their payroll and either co-opting them or setting them loose at some point. <coughs> the other thing, though, is. You know, the kinds of demands you were placing on the system were really very minimal. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, in fact, they didn't need it, but nonetheless, they were very minimal. Um, and I, I think that for, for a radical movement to, to really thrive, you've got to think of uh, demands that, you know, it's one thing to talk about, well, we're, we're for a future society like this, and we don't want screw, people screwed down, but what kind of intermediate demands can you place on the system that really challenge them? In a way that's saying, uh, well, don't uh, crash in people's doors and inspect whether they're sleeping with people. I mean, that, that's really very, very minimal. <laughs> Grant that they're not e eager to do it, but it's still very, very minimal. Uh, one, one, uh, uh, well, in terms of um, income for, for poor people, minimal wage, that'd be one thing to talk about. Um, a guaranteed income uh, for everybody. Um, you know, there, there are various things you could do, demands you could propose that uh, actually challenge the system in a way that, frankly, your demands weren't. I mean, they really weren't. I and mean, that's why they were answering your phone. You know? <laughs> they, they, they may have been annoyed, but they didn't actually answer the phone, right? Well, call up somebody and say, we want to have a 20-pound minimum wage. You want to, they won't answer that phone. You know, that's, that's not on the, uh, they'll just tell you that's crazy. That system won't work that way. And it won't. It won't work that way. That's why we're raising it. We're raising demands that challenge the system. So that's another point I wanted to raise about the, the claimants union, because it seemed to be a lack of trying to think of how do we go, granted you had a base, how do you go with that base to actually develop a program that really uh, challenges the system and, and leads the way towards a more radical transformation? I think that's a fair enough point, Eric, you know. The, the only thing I can say is that at the time, we, uh, an awful lot of the things that we were involved in in Castlemilk and everybody was involved in, we were re reacting to the situation a lot, you know, and that's certainly true. But that was vital to us, you know, I mean, our, our uh, income depended on that, maybe even our next meal, you know, uh, on that kind of reaction. I mean, I couldn't tell you how poor we were at the time and I'm not trying to play the, the, the heart strings or the, the heart strings <laughs> but he uh, and, and uh, along with a whole lot of other people so an awful lot it was immediate reaction but it was reaction that got results and helped at the time 
But there was not that mid-term or longer-term planning. Mm. You're quite right about that. And, uh, and also, I think maybe we weren't, we weren't expecting to be funded forever or, or you know, because we had all other irons in the fire as well. We were involved in half a dozen things at the one time up there, you know. And <laughs> paradoxically, some of the guys that uh, uh, were involved in the, the, the climate union became welfare rights workers. Or when the CAA opened up, they became, they joined the CAA, you know. But so there was that kind of thing. But no, you're, you're quite right. I, we certainly couldn't have done that with the small amount of people we had in Casamilk. We should maybe have been thinking about these things and talking about these things as a first step. I think when we had the Glasgow coordination or what was called Clydeside coordination of climate change, these issues would come up and there'd be this where the divergences would show. Mm -hmm. uh, although the, it was actually really good to have these meetings. Where it, it was a, you know, people flight from the West End. We went to a meeting in uh, Black Hill one day and it was, there was snow drifts everywhere, there was no buses on, but somehow we made it through and we're just treated like complete heroes when we actually arrived in Black <laughs> Hill. <You know? laughs> Especially as a bunch of uh, idiotic West Enders, <laughs> 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 um, but you know, so there was it broke down all sorts of barriers. You know, there was just, but I mean, th in terms of debate, yeah, there was people. Just, a lot of people just didn't have a perspective of a social transformation of society. Mm -hmm. There was always that battle going on. You're always going on about the claimants' charter, smash the cohabitation rule, being one part of it. You know, I. Um, I, I think the people that were coming to us, don't forget, most of them weren't there at all politicised, mm -hmm. you know. So in a way that was maybe the first steps of them being involved, mm -hmm. you know. So I don't know how ambitious <coughs> we could have been at that point. Can I finish up with a couple of funny wee anecdotes? <laughs> we maybe move on to something else, unless anybody's got any questions. Well, we've got, we're thinking about time as well. Oh, we've aye. got a few right. other things to get mm -hmm. through. Aye. So. So one thing, were you for the welfare state or were you fighting the welfare state? I think the welfare state now, and it's not necessarily the, form, the fault of a conservative government, right. it's of a benefit culture, is in need of an enormous reform. But did you think that in the 70s as well, or were you working with the welfare state trying to improve right, it? Right, well, no. I've never thought in terms like that, right? Um, as far as I'm concerned, ever since I was politically aware, I've seen the objective to be to get rid of capitalism and replace it with <coughs> something much, much better. He, at the time, obviously, if, I, if we'd have put leaflets out like that, we wouldn't be anywhere at yeah, the time. But you were heavily right? involved with we the We were having this di aye, dialogue and interaction, mm -hmm. and I've, uh, I've claimed money before of the state, of course, you know. And my advice to anybody is take as much as you can get, right? <laughs> and that's only talking about the welfare state. And uh, I don't mean by that organised crime syndicates <laughs> and stuff like that. I don't mean that. I'm talking about individually. And I've also advised young people that are complaining about the lack of career <coughs> opportunities to consider a life of crime, right? <coughs> because the objective is to get rid of the capitalist system. That's the whole thing. It's not enough just pottering about with various things. You might need it. I mean, we are all involved in it. We're all caught up in the web of capitalism. So we're interacting with every day, you know. But that should be always in our, our mind, you know. And that's what I tell other people as well. If people are only doing it for a certain short-term gain, well, I mean, I'm not saying I wouldn't help them. But that's not going to be enough. You know, we'll always be in, in uh, problems if that's the situation. Uh. But uh, to me, funny anecdote, there was one of the guys up in Castmilk, Keith will remember him, a guy called Eddie Graham. And uh, Eddie was like the most determined guy I've ever met. He's now dead, right? He was also a Stalinist, right? But don't let that completely put you off him, right? <laughs> and he was so much a Stalinist 
that he said that Stalin only had one fault and that was it was too soft <laughs> <laughs> so that gives you an example of Eddie but I learned an awful lot about believe it or not direct action for Eddie right I'll not explain why that seems a contradiction but I'll not even get into all that I know the answer I think now about that but anyhow <clears throat> one time we were in the social security office and usually at four o'clock they shut the doors and everybody's to leave well we were arguing a particular case by somebody and it had got right through the ranks up to the, the manager in the whole place and it was five o'clock by this time and he's wanting us to leave and the Eddie was pressing the point all the time <coughs> and at one point he turned around and he says to me he says to us the manager said Mr. Graham, you're being completely unreasonable. And Eddie turned and looked at me and says, I think we're getting something. <laughs> 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 so, and that's the sort of determination that Eddie and we developed, you know. Uh, the other, uh, it's okay to give the other <laughs> quick story, quick story. There was uh, so many people from England come up to Glasgow once for a conference. Uh, but at one point the climate unions went down to England, down to London for this uh, conference that was proposed and uh, we approached the social work guys, the head guy in social work who really just didn't want us in his office, you know and we were saying about this, we wanted money uh, over and above the grant money we got mm. to, go to attend this conference and this well scrubbed, suited guy, he's like this. Hey, how many people will be at this conference? How many people from Glasgow are going? And we said, well, we all want to go. And he's, oh, well, that's impossible. When we attend conferences, it's usually one or two people from each area or whatever. And we said, well, there's 13 climate unions in Glasgow now, you know. And he scribbles away and he says, well, allowing two delegates from each claimant's union, you know, he said uh, we could finance like 26 people staying overnight at a hotel and stuff like this. <laughs> and we said, how much does it come to? And he told us the final amount. And we said, well, just give us the money and we'll sort it out. <laughs> right, so... He says, oh, no, no, I couldn't do that. You need to put the boarding houses or hotels or whatever. We said, no, mm -hmm. give us the money. And it was practically robbery, you know. <laughs> and they, we didn't leave his office until he'd actually signed the cheque, you know. And they are authorised somebody to sign the cheque. And we went away and got the cheque cashed. And then we delegated one of the guys from Brother going to organise transport to get us to London and back and we worked out there was some like 40 odd people going you know or, and the, a ridiculous amount you know and we all arrived at the, it was night time when the bus left Rother going and there was this bus right there and it looked like something in the 1930s or something <laughs> they used to like Czechoslovakia <laughs> <laughs> and, and they, we all climbed on the bus and then the guy had organised the bus we said to him, you got this? <laughs> you know, with the money we gave you? They said, no, 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 we've got money left over. <laughs> and he came round and gave everybody a bag of money, like £10, £20 to everybody. Now, on the bus there was people... I would have preferred to tell them <laughs> <out there. laughs> It turned out that my premises were going to be some place it was a kind of it was a delinquent guys wasn't it <laughs> it, was your house, basically. Ah, it was it was some kind of I think it was going to be a place for delinquent boys as they were in the days and they'd made bunk beds and there was only a limited supply of mattresses and they, we had they arrived at the place no we did before that on the way down we got this money and people arrived and it was obvious a lot of the people were drunk and some of them had bought 
as they say in uh, Glasgow, a cargo with them. <laughs> and when they get this windfall as well, oh, that was brilliant, you know. <laughs> so the weather was also a factor, because actually for some reason it was it was wet in Scotland, but in, and when we went to England it was freezing, it was much so <laughs> the temperature was plunging as Aye. we were heading towards That's England. Right. And the back of your window, and the bus stop you broke No, that spell? was on the way back. Oh, was that the Aye. way back? <laughs> yeah, 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 but on the way... <laughs> and way down there, one of the guys, I don't, I don't know if it was for other one, but it was an old trade union guy, and he, he arrived in a wheelchair, and his wheelchair he actually, got on the bus, and, corpus, corpus. Corpus. and it got thrown in the, the luggage compartment <laughs> or whatever. And we were only ten minutes away when all these trunks, it was a football bus, and all these <laughs> trunks started singing. Stop the bus, we need a wee wee. And, <laughs> and the, the driver went, ah, We've only started, we're only 10 minutes into the journey. We'll never get there, it's the case. But anyway, that's what happened. And, and hey, man, because of the, the back window being smashed, there was ice in the Some inside local of the bus. Kids have seen the Scottish bus coming down. I think you were in a sleeping bag, but you know, some people were in sleeping bags. Ah. In the bus. Is that one of these Fellini films or something? Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's, it's one of the great plays that's waiting to be written. <laughs> so, do, are most people aware of Spirit of Revolt and of the website? Mm -hmm. So, here you can access what's been scanned so far. And if you're looking at material, there's a search engine, so you can search. Anything that's written in the description will come up in the search. And if there's a material that hasn't been scanned that you want to look at, then uh, you can just email. Uh, the contacts are there. You can mm -hmm. email John Cousins and arrange to come in and see the material, and I take the material to the Glasgow City Archives, which is... The room next door, and you can come in, come in, and actually look at it. So there's been various exhibitions as well. We had one 100 years of protest literature exhibition that was in the Mitchell Library, which was really good. And this anti-war movements, which was was that two years ago or a year ago? Well, that's 2015. Uh, and that's a text that Maria is here has written about. Uh, First World War descent in, Gla in Scotland. So there's various things that you can access through uh, the website and you can request to come up and look at material. And you can also donate material if you've got material that fits in with the acquisitions policy, uh, which is about preserving, <laughs> collecting and preserving working class socialist past and present. Keith, do you want to talk about how it was kind of set up? Um, I think when it was set up, it was a kind of realisation that um, a number of people who've been crucial um, around the kind of liberty and socialist anarchist scene uh, for years had passed on and basically there was no real record of anything they'd been involved in. You know, one significant person that would be touched on John's life, etc., was David Carruthers, you know, and you know these people. Uh, so there was a sense that you know, we're, we we really need to catch up here in this, and it's there's, there's, it's it's overdue. But let's do it now, you know, uh, because we have, uh, you know, the, fortunately some of the stuff from the past was in the Bailey's collection, uh, uh, you know, which was initially in Glasgow University, then came to be incorporated here in the archive section in the Mitchell, but. Uh, and there was other stuff that had been donated to the Mitchell that was lying in a box in the basement, basically, which we had christened the Bratak Do Collection. But uh, you know that was that had had to be disco rediscovered 28 years later, uh, and then it folks was incorporated in our in our uh, thing. But so um, when we got started, uh, we had a succession of meetings and we got some funding. We, we employed an archivist, Chris Cassells, and he started the cataloguing system. And uh, you know, that, and we, since then, there's been a number of different archivists uh, uh, 
and uh, they've extended that and various more, a lot more people have actually added on collection. You can see Black Act do there is number five, but actually in terms of when that was came into being in the Mitchell, it was actually would have been number one if it had been uh, passed on to us initially. You know, uh, so and all the blue things there, things you click on, obviously there, which have been digitised. Uh, the, the John Cooper collection is the one that's been digitised the most. We've got the intention of, uh, um, you know, basically having that completely digitised, and that's very, very much soon. You know, um, some other ones have got the digitisation at various, various. Um, so, but most people will access the collection through that rather than, you know, being a researcher and wanting to see physical copies. Uh, um, we don't digitise everything. In some cases, the beat's been digitised by other projects mm -hmm. like Libcom and um, the, the, the uh, centre in Nottingham, which is just... Sparrow's Nest. Yeah, uh, for example. So we work in, uh, in conjunction with these people. And in fact, when Sparrow, uh, Sparrow's Nest uh, had a presentation at the Anarchist Book Fair about four years ago, we actually happened to be down there and took an active part in that presentation. So although there's not a formal network of archi archiving organisations around, uh, there is a kind of a, uh, informal uh, help system. You know? um, so a lot of different people have uh, come and gone and will you know, uh, we'll, we'll donate their volunteer labour for a while as, 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 um, as scanners, as, as I'm known. <laughs> And uh, that continues to this day. Uh, say we uh, we meet once a month, usually. Yeah, but that's right. I mean, it's not the sum total of what we do. Obviously, we want to have an impact around in terms of displays and th things like that. So, uh, and also uh, t t some the spirit revolves active in other projects like keeping May Day alive and things like that. Um, I've worked in conjunction with the Industrial Workers of the World and other organisations such as the Scottish Peace Network. So we, we do have a collaborative approach. Your search engines, do you have a subject search engine that can go through any collection and pick out, say, Poltax or I think Minus if you type stroke. in a name or yeah, something, so it should come up. Yeah, yeah, so anything that's written, the way it's catalogued is it has a reference number <coughs> and then it has a title or a description yeah. and this is uh, the title and the dis dis description here so anything uh, that's there can be searched so give us a search that you want to do um, <laughs> what about what about the uh, keeping a primary school open somewhere So then it would come up which collection that it was in. So in the Charlie Baird collection, there's a lot of stuff about education. Uh, that was when we were involved in the free school at Barrowfield, mm -hmm. uh, so it was quite significant. Um, uh, there's stuff in Keith Miller's, there's stuff in John Cooper's, there's stuff in Alex. So that then you would just go into those collections and then further search. I yeah. Wondering a couple of things, maybe we could have a. Uh, mailing list for those people who you know, yeah. are in contact with SOR. <coughs> and the other thing is... We're not government funded. No, we're not government <laughs> funded and really a lot depends on <laughs> the uh, direct debit. So if anybody is interested in uh, having a direct debit order that goes to SOR, it'd be good if you could talk to Paula and then we can send you by email the little form that you have to fill out. You can one final thing is I'm, I'm trying to coordinate the fast lane stuff. So if anybody here was at any time involved with the peace cam, I'd like to hear from you because uh, we're trying to collect yeah, almost anything connected with the uh, peace cam newsletters, um, yeah, minutes of meetings, correspondence, mementos, short stories that were written about it, you name it. So we're trying to put together a, a broad archive of the peace camp and then 
once we have it done, obviously we'll make exhibits using that material. So if you if you were involved or if you know anybody who was involved in the Peace Camp, it's been going on for 30 years, so uh, contact us. I'll just pass this round if people want to put their name in, if they want to join the email. Oh, I can ask, what's the situation with the Ethel McDonald collection? Is that any, anybody you liked in it, it's for it the whole collection? No. No? No. It's in the Bailey's collection, which ah. John Taylor Colwell had uh, assembled from, you know, he was the remnant of that group, and, you know, apart from writing books, he passed on all the material, including slight spy Civil War flags and everything to the Bailey's collection and yeah. it was itemised, we got a copy uh, uh, of that, right. uh, we're not supposed to have a copy but we never let have a copy and uh, we got to look at it and I think Eric did a bit of research into it as well, is that right? Uh, well, we're thinking about it and <laughs> it's yeah. one of my topics of interest. You must have looked at it a wee bit. I, I have seen it. I've actually had access to the box many, many years ago. Right, I mean there is, see these display boxes that are out in the foyer just mm -hmm. now? There, there's um, two pages of a guy, Aldred scrapbook mm -hmm. on exhibition and another Red Clyde Tider who became a lord or a sir. Is it an ILP or something? Uh, yeah. Man Shinwell or something? Um, no, no, is it Ferguson? Um, but I think there's discussion or uh, between Spirit of Revolt, Stacia and John Cousins mm. with, uh, because within <coughs> Glasgow libraries you have the city archives and you have mm. special collections, mm. so special collections is part of the library mm. oh. and that's where the material about Guy Aldred and Ethel MacDonald from the Baileys, that's where all the Baileys stuff went. So it would make sense because there is quite, we're going to be working uh, in various collections within Spirit of Revolt. There's a lot of Guy Aldred material, the word that you, that was in your collection. But there's a lot of Guy, the word uh, in other collections, pamphlets, publications. So we're going to bring all that together into one kind of Guy Aldred collection. So it would make sense then if there's that the stuff that's held at um, special collections was put together with that, but I think that's, at, at least we can let people know that yeah. within the description, so the, the, the finding aid that the, there's also Guy Aldred material ab available within special collections at Glasgow well, Of City course, this and stuff won't be digitised, so if we yeah. made an offer to digitise it, even though it wasn't actually in our collection, just like we've done with the James Kelvin yes. collection, yeah. uh, we could, uh, you know, that would be a positive outcome, but it might be a lot of negotiation required. <laughs> I think there might even be issues with that, because a lot of the, the film, a lot of the Ethel McDonald stuff takes back to the 30s, yeah. and There'll even be conservation issues in relation to digitising. Yeah, that. exactly. Well, we digitised really old material before. I mean, so you have to be careful how you do it. <coughs> it's not easy because there have a lot of old staples and things, and it's quite. Mm. Uh, 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 well, uh, I'm a little so bit. <laughs> but that's stuff we've already got access to. <laughs> do you know where you sit? If uh, McDonald had any relation still around in Belfort? Um, well, the person who wrote the book on him, uh, on, on Ethel McDonald, was it Chris Dolan or something? Uh, he he would have done the research. If it, uh, if there's a while it was actually you could get it in bargain books or something. A couple of years ago, you could pick up the Ethel McDonald book. Uh, um, but he would have, he would have probably uh, made all the contacts. Uh, unfortunately, obviously, with John Taylor Colville passing away, a lot of these connections with various people are, um, are not there any longer. So we don't actually ourselves have any contact because there's no, you know, there's no continued. She was very much a lone, a lone fish in mm -hmm. her family. She wasn't, uh, you know, uh, there was nobody else who was swimming along with her at all. You know, um, <coughs> I suppose she could have died prematurely as well. You know, just in the fifties. So. Um, so no, we don't have any direct connection, but the author would be, you know, if you can look up that book, uh, I, I need to look at my own copy, it's mine itself in the title, but, 
Well, it's worth checking out. He would have contacts. Yeah. Do you know him? Well, no, no. no uh, um, there was also a, a person, it might be the same person, but under a slightly different name, he wrote a song called Bells From Bells Hill to Barcelona, which appeared on the album Blantar to Barcelona, which was put together by trade unions in North Lanarkshire to celebrate the um, people going to Spain as part of the... Uh, you know, the Maybe also might be in the <coughs> at Glasgow Uni? Not to my knowledge. No. Well, Mark Gonzalez was involved in the uh, film that was made exactly. up, an anarchist story. Oh, right, maybe uh, it was that. So he might have some contacts. So, mm. you know, he's still alive. He's but the, still alive. But the author guy would definitely be the person who would have tried to track down family members and things. And, um, we had connections I mean, way back in the past with people in Blind Tire who were involved in a group you know, which dated way back to you know, the beginning of the 20th century and had visiting speakers like Emma Goldman would visit the mines and things. Yeah. Really? But these Blanter. people, you know... Oh, Blanter? She's Blanter, that's it. Right. <laughs> yeah. But it was actually <laughs> Burn Bank, more from. specifically within Blantyre. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they, they had like running fights in during the mid to late 30s when the Spanish Civil War was going on with, you know, people who supported the CP line in Spain and stuff. So it was a... It's all this group did as well, but it's just a sight of you know the, the big battles going on, the miners, uh, miners welfare or something over over <laughs> you know, in Spain. You know. It's only it's like the only moment I've ever felt proud to come to Blackpool. Emma Goldman. Well, she was one of many I think that visited. Uh, I mean, maybe for Falkton, they even did it before the first World War. You know, Faltering Declare in Govan Hill. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Faltering Declare. It's just that we like we would have visiting speakers in the seventies, like Albert Meltzer and you know, whatever. You know, it's not it wouldn't be uncommon that uh, you know because there'd be no no video conference in there. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you actually had to go to Blantyre. Yeah, you have to go your way to go to all these places. You know. But even how, how did how did we somebody put the plant and contact Emma Goldman from? You know, it was come. just letter writing, basically. People, the secretary of every group, I mean, we would put, you'd put the, all the groups would have newsletters. I mean, I don't recall just because there was no internet uh, stifling any any turnout in meetings. Far from it. You know, I remember huge attendances at uh, anarchist groups and things. So it was yeah, just a combination of newsletters, letter work. writing, and, <laughs> and, and the phoning. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I mean, I used Scott. it in the 80s. I used to yeah. uh, write to London, uh, post it at yeah. 5 to yeah. 6 and yeah. post sure in Northern Ireland and it would arrive in Hackney. Yeah. But, if they, but if they were doing it, you would know over here to do a tour or something, the word would go to know, the local ah, well, places. Of course, there's a bush telegram. Mm -hmm. Yeah, excellent. Thinking it's actually it's an area of saying about how hard it is was to communicate, and true, but uh, but Keith does raise a point because it's so easy to communicate now electronically, it's harder to get people off their butt to come. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I don't know. It's, uh, you can well, argue it both ways. There's also, there's much more distraction. Capitalism has been very savvy. It's put tons and tons and tons of distraction there to really muddy the waters. <laughs> <coughs> can I say, Paul, I see the the wee talk that I gave there about the claimant union, that to some extent is history, right? At Disney, it's not doing the, the stuff it used to do now. So in that, to that extent, it's history. But the struggle continues, as they say, right? Mm -hmm. And anybody that isn't involved in something should be. And at this, even to this day, I'm outside job centres on occasion, you know, leaflets try to engage people and so on, you know, uh, and that that's only in relation to welfare benefits, but we should all be involved in something and we should encourage other people to become involved as well, because apart from anything else, what I did they mention, in which should always be the forefront of her mind, it's fun as well, mm -hmm. right, and uh, you know, it's a social thing, mm -hmm. and uh, that's two good reasons to be involved in it. Especially if you're one of these people that feel you don't have any social circle or whatever, you know. <laughs> so you really should, anybody that is already involved should be involved. 
And if they don't know how to, ask me. <laughs> <laughs> Right, well, thanks very much. Great, thank you. Everybody for coming along. I think, think that's very just much about us, really. Is it two? Have we got a, a date for the one in May? We don't have a date, no, but no. We're, we do plan to, I think the next one's going to be the Alan Burnett collection. <coughs> it's not together. Yeah, I think there's going to be a question of occupations and sporting. Yeah, I yeah. I yeah. Remember, uh, yeah. But we'll certainly let people know and yeah. if, how. If, how did you find out about this event? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So we'll certainly let people know. Because um, I think it's a good way to come together and just talk about, spend some time thinking about the collection. And uh, I mean, you could even just, if you wanted a run through, or if you were had a specific interest in certain areas like political pamphlets or magazines from the 70s, it's all there, so if you needed a hand to, you know, look for something, you know, just get it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.